Ollie Sharp needs no introduction. Let's be honest, he's a Beanock in the tech sales industry. He started his career in recruitment before transitioning to tech sales, working and leading teams for the likes of LinkedIn and scaling sales loft to 125 people and $25 million in revenue. His LinkedIn says he is passionate about growing businesses, building culture and developing people. So there is no surprise why he is one of the most influential and well-respected leaders in the industry. Now working as the VP of sales at Abacom, I can't wait to see where he takes this business. And today we speak about the passion for scaling businesses, the recipe for success, how to build a high performing sales team and developing your people and culture. This episode is really an honest insight into Ollie's career, his success and what drives him. Let's get into it. So today we're going to speak about something that Ollie is a genius at, which is building and growing sales teams from the ground up. You worked at Sales Loft, you built it from yourself up yes. to 125 people. Something like that. That wasn't just sales, that was across the business. Okay. And I ended up as MD for EMEA, etc., with some reports, etc. But yeah, the biz the EMEA business built up to 125. Incredible. Like and you've also worked at LinkedIn. Now you've just started your new venture at Abacum. And it seems like you're really excited about getting in from the ground, building organizations and growing with them. What is it about that that excites you? It's just, just a creation. I think that when when I've when I worked at LinkedIn, I was there for quite a long time. And when I started LinkedIn, I would was one of the first 14 people outside the US. So it's very much a startup environment. Mm -hmm. And it got to a stage that I wasn't being creative. And my bachelor's degree was graphic design. So I like creation. I know it's a different type of creation, but I like creating stuff and yeah. building stuff. And when I when a company gets to a size like LinkedIn did, I stopped having that passion and that purpose. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to move to a, a sales loft and then to again, again to an Abercom. And I just like building from the ground up. I like seeing something that you can see the impact you've had. I'm maybe narcissistic. I don't know. That it's, <laughs> it's all about me. But um, yeah. it's I just love putting the processes and the structures in place the basics and stuff that can help you build. And the, the hiring side helps. I came from recruitment in the beginning. So mm. building all of that just excites me. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning and gives me purpose. Mm. Would you say that's your why? Because we talk about like, what is your driver? Is that something that you feel like you want to make a difference? I think the main why for me is uh, impacting others. And okay. I think that I love uh, coaching, developing and impacting the happiness of people that are around me and in my organization. But yeah, it is part of it, the creation mm. of it. And when I was looking for a job, I wanted a company where I could either build really from the ground up or go in and mend something that was literally crushing it down to the ground and building it up again. Yeah. So that was the the must have for me with with a job that would excite me. So yeah, it does get me out of bed in the morning. And not to say you're Mary Poppins that comes in to save the day. <laughs> Never been called that before. But <laughs> with your big handbag and your umbrella. You weren't going to talk about my handbag. But oh, sorry, on. sorry, it's in the corner. We'll, we'll get it on screen later. Um, but when do you feel like your job there is done, like as a leader and somebody that might be listening to this that feels like they have that same drive and urge to build teams? Well, I, I think it's slightly different for me being mm -hmm. completely honest because I've always worked for American companies so up until now so I'm not sure I would say my job was done I think yeah. it was that there was a ceiling as to what I could do mm -hmm. so I'm now a, a European well American on paper Euro European company sort of thing that there isn't a ceiling to where I can go that I can right. become CRO hopefully and stuff like that so I'm not sure there is a that my job is done it just tends to be a ceiling that's misaligned between you and the company you work for and the roles you do. Mm -hmm. So I do think there is something that means my job is done to the capacity I can at this in this current stage. Yeah. But we should it's it's not like I go I I want to develop to be able to run a whole revenue organization globally. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I've walked away saying, oh, I, my job's done and I can't move to that level. I want to get to that level. And that's why I've come to more of a, a European, mainly European mm. company. Well, it sounds exciting. It and is. I can't wait to see you get to that CRO level. But today we want to talk about how you build and grow those teams. So starting with the basics and the recipe for success, which mm. is building a successful sales organization and sales team. So what would you say are the ingredients of a high performing team? So I think there's one part of it is the recipe. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. which is how you actually go to market and how you actually sell. And while between jobs, I was doing quite a lot of advisory work and consulting work for, for startups. Mm -hmm. And I found very common problems across these startups. They're normally founder-led sales, etc. They hadn't built a narrative, a how do we talk about our product. The, pro the, the way they talk about their product is very uh, technical rather than outcome focused and looking for pain points that can solve and it's more mm. around use case. So I think that the first thing that I would advise people to think about is how you talk about your product and how you build that narrative. Right. And the rest of it is building around that, how you put all the basics in place. Because really what you want to do is people, playbook is an overused term, but you basically want to give the people, everybody that joins the recipe of how to do their job. Mm -hmm. And that's really the basics. So if it's an SDR, what activities... I don't agree with micromanagement and stuff like this, but mm. I do agree with understanding what activities are needed from an SDR to be successful. So if an SDR joins, you've got to tell them, teach them how to talk about what we do, how, what their activities need to be like and the cadences or sequences set mm -hmm. up in the system, et cetera, and how to use the technology. And it's the same for each role. So when you move to an AE, they obviously need to know how to do some outbound, how to use the systems, how to talk about our products, et cetera. So, I think that one of my abilities is to take something that's complex and make it simple. And that's because I'm not very intelligent. That I have to make it simple. I think Jeez, that's what you it got this far. You must I be think that's smart. what it's about. So if it, like going into Abercom, people weren't talking about what we do in the same way. And mm -hmm. it was quite complex. I was struggling to understand it. I've now put it into basic English that anyone can understand it. Mm. And I think that's very important because you've all got to be aligned on how you talk about it and you've got to help. So really putting everything back to the basics of activities, etc., and writing a recipe of how you do it that you can literally give someone a book of how to do it, that covers that side. And that's how I would suggest most what companies and teams should be doing, go back to basics and build mm. from there. Do you think there's a level to that though? Because as you mentioned, let's like just go back to the basics of what it actually is that you're doing mm. and people buy from people. So it's all about like building that relationship with people. But if you are selling within a sector that maybe is a bit more technical, mm -hmm. do you think there is a limit to that? No, I, I mean, people do buy from people, just going back to that bit. But I do think that the best salespeople are half person, half robot. And okay. it's, we use, I wouldn't say we use Medic to a T like lots of companies mm -hmm. do, but we, I rolled it out at SalesLoft. What Medic does is it takes the actual, it makes you robotic in the way that you think about how you qualify a deal. Mm -hmm. And that's the bit of, you don't need to be human for. And I'm trying to get people to, that takes your happy years away from it. And yeah. then you have the human side, which is yes, how you go talk about it. But they've got to know what, they've got to make it clear what you're selling as well at the same time. So it's right. all three of them. But yes, they do need, people do buy from people. You've got to show the personality, but then you've got to be a robot in your brain as well. And you've got to know exactly what you're talking about, how you're selling it. I think mm. the more technical it comes, you're right. It's, it's a complete, I've always worked in, business applications not IT applications yeah. and I don't think I could work in that it's, it's, yeah. it's not my area <laughs> yeah. um, and it's so business applications yes it's understanding the persona you're talking to mm. and they want to buy for a business reason normally and that hence it's business applications yeah people that are running sales teams at the moment um, it's a tough market there's no like going around that how do you help your sales team to drive that urgency and build that momentum because I think that's a real important topic at the moment. You mean in regards to how do we motivate our teams in a tough climate sort yeah. of thing? I think it, it is hard and I think that it's to me it's about being compassionate or empathetic of the situation mm -hmm. because we can't expect them to pull deals out of nowhere if they're, if they're not happening. Mm -hmm. So whether it is reducing targets or just being a bit more empathetic of the situation, I think showing that you've got their back and you're uh, helping them and understand, I think that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. I don't want uh, I don't want to report to someone that's talking about unrealistic stuff. I want someone that goes, I understand the situation's bad. How do we make the most of it? How can we still push and get the most we can? Mm -hmm. So... That's what I lean on. I think that still it's, if you go, I, I would also go back to the metric side as well, because if you're, 
there's a very good podcast that John McMahon did with the guy that was um, CRO for uh, Sprinkler. And he talks yeah. about how you motivate people. And there's people, if you motivate them and get them to do stuff to be compliant compared to to because you give them a purpose. Mm-hmm. And I think that if you say to people, yeah, these are the activities we need from you, that's different. But if you're saying, come on, we still need to get to 5 million, we need to get to 10 million, mm. we just need to increase the activity levels for us to hit this goal, that's doing it so they're actually there's a purpose behind it Mm. and that's different i think in a time when we need to be empathetic that becomes more powerful a leader that is not understanding and still going for right i need more activity from you that's a different situation and you'll probably leave your people as soon as the market turns Mm. lose your people as soon as the market turns and i think it's all about that communication and just talking to them about why you're asking for this. Agreed. If you are increasing their KPIs, tell them exactly why. I think often people come into sales because they have that almost entrepreneurial spirit and want to like manage their own desk and have their own career that they're like in charge of. And if they feel like they're not in charge all of a sudden and they don't understand why they're being made to do something, yep. then they won't feel listened to. Agreed. Them. They've got you've got to sort of get them to buy into the end goal, yeah. which is, and, and understand the end goal and how you get to the end goal. It's like giving them a map. You've got to go a different yeah. route nowadays because you've got to speak to more people. Which is tough, because I think a lot of leaders probably don't know what the end goal is at the moment. And uh, also <laughs> I mean, going some, out into the dark, being like, let's all just do this together. But it's, it's, sometimes it's to survive, but at the same time, yeah. it's just to get the best you can. Which yeah. it's, I'd rather us... I, and I think it's about empowering your people and making sure that they feel part of something mm. in these tough times, not just a number. Because if you make someone feel like a number when the going gets tough, it's you're bound to lose your people when when everything turns and there are jobs around. Yeah, definitely. Um, I want to touch briefly on the athlete mentality. Mm-hmm. I know that this is something that you're really passionate about. And when speaking of the recipe for success, there is some correlation around athletes and that mindset and mm-hmm. that what can be transferred into sales. So although we don't have an hour to talk about this, which I'm sure we could do a whole nother topic on, but what can we really take from athletes and put it within our organizations for both sales teams? Yeah, and it's when you talk about athletes, I'm obviously not, yeah, yeah. An, I'm oh, obviously no, no, not an athlete. Yeah, 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 no, yeah you are. <laughs> exactly. Like, how can we be not you? Quite, uh, yeah, <laughs> not with this bod. Um, so I think how that, many donuts <laughs> do we need to eat? <laughs> exactly, you got me. Uh, I think there's, there's two parts to this, because I think that the um, athletes are generally competitive. Mm-hmm. And but and when when you're hiring, taking someone with an athlete's mindset and uh, who has done sort of sport, I think is normally quite good. I mean, it's not just about that, but they tend to be competitive, etc. You've just got to make sure that you get the ones that are competitive, but also team orientated. Not yeah. necessarily done a team sport, but you can't have someone. I don't want someone that is a pure lone wolf that's just going to mm-hmm. go smash target and piss everyone else off, basically. But I think the the athlete's mindset to me is more about. There's a book called uh, The Game Plan by Dr. Steve Bull, who was a psychologist for lots of uh, British sports professionals, and he talks about. There's four different types of endurance uh, of of toughness that you need endurance toughness turn uh, turnaround toughness and these kind of things and it's about how you deal with tri- tough situations. Mm-hmm. One of them, for example, is ad- dealing with adversity and setback. How you actually he, how he coaches people is to have a uh, peak performance. Uh, per- these hills that you sort of talk about your past successes on that remind you of that. Okay, but then it's about how you can learn from your mis- from what's happened and move on and go on to the next thing mm-hmm. and there's uh also things about um I mean, when you think about it, Swartz and Law did a lot about this peak performance pyramid, which they studied tennis players for them to work out how people turn around from uh, a tough game to the next game and stuff like that. Right. And it's about having mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual rituals in place. A spiritual, okay. Which is really good. I yeah. And I've done this exercise with my teams a number of times. When it says spiritual, it's about having a purpose and values, okay. not sitting down doing yoga or anything meditating. like that. <laughs> so that <laughs> this but, is what we see in your sales <laughs> floor. Yes, Everybody's just, just so zen. Chilled, just um, <laughs> no, it's, it, it, it's what it teaches people is that you've got, for you to be at your best, and it's not just about for you to turn up to work, but for you to be at your best as a salesperson, as a sports professional, as anything, having the being able to spend time with your family and your loved ones, 
do the things that you like, playing whatever sport it is, mm. playing guitar, taking time out. Your brain only works for 90 minutes of peak performance at a time. So you've got to have your breaks, you've got to have your weekends, yeah. switching off in the evening, all of those kind of things, but having that, um, that purpose as well. So all of that is taken from sport but put into the professional world so how you deal with shit mm. and actually how you can be cut how you are at your best so i do this exercise where people see sort of grade themselves on the four areas and right. work out where they're not where they're letting themselves down a little bit to then commit to say right i'm going to go to the gym more oh, i'm going to drink more water i'm going to get more sleep or anything like that i'm sorry um so <laughs> it's yeah so there's i think there's lots of things that have come from sport because yeah. sport is way ahead of business in certain ways the way that they look at the science of it the psychology of it and i think we can learn a lot from it into our space if you were to grade yourself on the four, what would you be set at at the moment? Um, at the moment, um, I think I have the purpose. I mean, yeah. the spiritual side. The mental side, I probably... Uh, the mental, emotional side, I think I let myself down on. Mm -hmm. Physical, I do. I mean, I do just take the dog for a walk every morning, but I've, and I've started playing tennis again, but I'm just not very good at, at doing... At, getting my ass off the sofa uh, but I think it's uh, I think with my daughter having GCSEs her going to the Reading Festival all of these kind of things I think my stress levels aren't it's where they lot. need to be right but I I, I recognise it my wife's a therapist so she helps me understand where my head is at the oh time my stuff, so I have my own uh, at home therapist bless her she never has a day off does she she does <laughs> she comes home she's like oh, right back to work Ollie so let's chat yes. Uh, well, at least you're being aware. I think that's the most important thing is. is to just like look inside and understand because you're not going to be perfect at all four and you're going to have dips and, and highs and lows and everything. And I think it's just that mentality, as you mentioned, of like, how can you get back up? understand what areas you need to work on and then do something to rectify it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But I would, if you read the game plan and the Schwartz and law book, I can't remember what the book's called, but those two books are very good around this area. Yeah. We'll put it in the notes. Cool. Oh my gosh. That's the first time I said that. We'll put it in the show notes underneath <laughs> so you can read it. <laughs> so professional. Um, okay. So we've spoken about the recipe for success. Now let's talk about building sales teams. Mm. So I know it's something you spent a long time in recruitment and obviously building building up your teams that you've done in your past roles. What would you look for when hiring a team? I think, I mean, good talent is, is uh, the quick and easy answer yeah. to that. I think that the better, you want to be able to attract A players. A mm -hmm. players attract other A players, etc. And I've seen it happen a lot. But I think really what I'd do is I'd put it into two areas. I think about the type of people you hire, because I think so many people hire on experience rather than skill set and ability right and i think that looking at a cv i mean I, you see some startups that hire from the likes of dell and ibm they're probably not used to working in the same environment mm -hmm. as a startup and i think that if you look at my background going from sales loft to abacom i wasn't fpna software or anything like that what it was was I was taking a, a product to market that we had to educate and that's why it makes my skills relevant to mm -hmm. going to Abercom. So I think that if you look at higher on skills rather than CV and experience, mm -hmm. I mean, experience forms your skills. That's one area that I would talk about that I think is very, very important. But then also on top of that, I think it's around the diversity of the people you take on. Yeah. And I, I, yes, around gender diversity and stuff like that, I think that's very important. You've got to have that as well. But what I mean more so in this is sort of the cognitive and experience diversity. Mm. So the be I believe the best teams, you don't put a football team on the pitch with 11 goalies, okay? So why would you put a team of eight AEs together, for example, with all the same skill? Mm. The way that I see it, I believe, is that if you... You sort of take a range of people. My first, the first team I where this comes from, the first team I built at LinkedIn, I made a mistake. I hired a lot of similar people to me, similar backgrounds, similar per personality, etc. So when we sat there thinking of ideas and who we can learn, how we can learn off each other, we were like. Well, we can't. Like, so, is it because they, you wanted them to be like, "That's a great idea, yeah. Ollie"? That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. Exactly, it makes You're me feel good. You're all each other's biggest cheerleaders. In exactly. that <laughs> well, it, and it just didn't work, and I yeah. didn't realise that at the time because I think you, you, as a first time leader, you think, "Okay, well, everyone should be like like me or like each other." But then, when I went to Salesloft, I was hiring 
I was trying to get it as diverse as possible because what normally happens is you but you build a cluster of people that are similar, then you realize you need different skills, and then these people you hire become the outsider. What you're better doing is from the beginning going as wide as possible. So yeah. when you look at uh, what the team I built at Salesloft, Tom Boston and Jack Nico, they're bloody different, very very different. Yeah. They both started in the same role, both but both came with different skills, different personalities. So. Being diverse in those skills, because what you want is that everyone has their superpower and everyone can learn from somebody else. Mm. And if you build it like that, for example, at Abercom, I've got someone that had loads of finance experience but lacked sales experience. I've got someone that is no finance but lots of sales, and I've got someone in the middle. Mm. If I have that, and one's very analytical, one's very salesy, et cetera. If we have that, and if you think about all of these little bits and you merge them all together, you have the best person, then you can have the best team. So that's how I see mm. it. I may be wrong, but that's, no, I that's, think that's what a really I good approach. think about building. That's what helped me at Salesloft. And I think I built a good team at Salesloft. Yeah, you definitely did. And you're right. It is creating that diversity of thought. If you have the same people, then you're not going to grow as a business. And I know when we had spoke before, it's like putting everybody out on the table and just being like, where are the gaps? What do you need to fill? Yeah. And that's quite difficult to do sometimes when you're in the team. It is. And I think it's about like the, the culture ad, not just culture fit. So many people yeah. go there, culture fit. It's like, well, What's the, are they a culture ad? And also, is your culture good? Like mm. you're fitting to a culture that might be bad, that exactly. you need to change. Yep. And I know that's something that we'll come on to because that's something that you're very passionate about throughout your career. But to your first point of looking at somebody that's got the right skills rather than experience, great point. But how do you know that when you are getting applicants through... For with, and you're just looking at their CVs and you're just looking at their LinkedIn. You mm. don't know what those skills are and what makes and what their superpowers are until you go through the interview process. And sometimes people want to hire quickly. I mean, I, I think that what I would suggest is you open out on the experience. Most people go, I want someone that's sold to finance, sold an FBA to blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And it's like this. And I'm not saying just go for anybody, but just go for the skill side. I yeah. think what it is is try be a bit more open with those, in my view, that you go, like I'll say, I want someone that's done two years plus SAS, that's had an A, because I think it's more, when it comes to the things on paper, I want someone that's sold the type of sell Rather than a competitive price sell, I want something that's someone's taken something to market. I want someone that's sold to the business side of a, of a company. Probably the ACV and the rhythm of closing is more important. So I'd rather if if someone to hit target has to hit close four deals a month, I want someone that's closing between three and six deals a month. Right. Not someone that's closing one deal a quarter because it's just not the right rhythm. Okay. All of those are the bits that go right. How do we get from a thousand to a hundred? Mm. And then from there, it's more about the other things that I would look at, which are and I think I mean the, in the interview process. Interview process is very key. I tend to have a different interview process for each role, not as in for each AE role, but different for AE, different for SDR. Mm -hmm. And that sounds quite obvious, but when I mean what I mean by that is the 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 activity I need to take them through the role play is very different because I'm testing for different skills, not just SDR as SDR, AE as AE. Uh, one thing I always do, and I'm give a bit of a hint here, is when we do a role play, I want someone that's coachable. So whenever we do a role play, I will always pick them up on something and say, I think you should try this this way and see how well they respond to it. Interesting. That was really hard when I interviewed the best salesperson I've ever interviewed, a guy called Will Eves who joined uh, Sales Loft. I interviewed him and he can teach me so much about sales and I'd try to pick fault with his with his role play and it was just like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. How am I going to coach you? Can exactly, you coach me? <laughs> exactly. He, he could coach me a lot. So yeah, it was funny when, when you do it someone like that, but it showed that he, I managed to pick one thing, but he responded in a way that it could I could see he could take coaching on board, mm. etc. So you want someone that can coach. I do think that a lot of salespeople, not a lot of sales, some salespeople believe that it's purely down to the manager to coach and develop them. And we'll talk about this in a minute. But I want to test that they see it as partly their job to cope to be coached and be developed at the same time. Right. Because you can't coach someone if they're not open to it. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. And with those interview processes that you mentioned and we won't get into every, what, what you do for your SDR interviews because we could be here all day but what are some questions that you ask to really understand whether they're the right person I one thing I ask all the time is what's the last thing you did to develop yourself mm -hmm. I also want to find out 
for them to be the best they can be at their job where they need to develop, it just shows whether they're aware of their weak, whether you call them weaknesses or whatever. But yeah. it's last thing they did to develop themselves shows uh, did they take ownership of it mm -hmm. rather than, well, no, my manager does everything. And if someone says, well, my company put me through this course, then what did you do? So mm -hmm. what did you decide to do? Um, and then, yeah, the, uh, what else to ask? I'd say, they're the main ones. And then I do the coaching bit. Um, last thing to develop, where would we need to develop you to be the best? And mm. what's your superpower that you can help others with? I think awareness of their skills and their weaknesses is is important to me. Yeah. Um, so I'd say those, but then I interrogate them about their numbers as well. And what's the best question you've been asked? Some people turn my questions around on me, which I think is a good idea. Okay. Which some people have said, you've asked me this, what's your thoughts on it and stuff like this? What's the last thing you did to develop yourself? Um, yeah. And, um, Do you think it's a good idea? Because you came up with that I question. Like to... You're like, that's smart. I thought it's quite a decent idea because it shows that I practice what I preach and stuff like mm. that. It's not just that I'm asking questions and it means nothing to me. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the... the ten, the best questions that that I answer in most depth tend to be more about how I see leadership and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say they're the best questions. It's just what I enjoy talking about. So they just get me chatting away. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's asking me the questions I've asked them, the, the one that stands out the most, I would say. You know, you're going to get so many applications to work at your company now and they're going to all ask those great questions. So <laughs> exactly. you're welcome. Well, yeah. I'll know you've watched this if, you've done, if you do that. <laughs> to round off building a successful sales team, I know that we've spoken about this previously on a panel that we did for Making Moves, um, but you spoke about the importance of when you're talking about diversity, being committed versus being compliant. Yep. I think this is a really important lesson for people to understand when building sales teams, but also when in the teams themselves, of how to build that culture that we'll get onto. Why Why is this important to you? Uh, because I think that people are doing it for compliance reasons. It's bullshit, it's, if I can swear on this, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you can. Um, it's, I think it, it's just, you've got to do it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And it's not a case, there's lots of companies nowadays are trying to get X number of females at each level and everything, which is great, fantastic, but do it because it's the right thing to do, not just because you feel that it's going to look good in the press and stuff like that. Mm. And I think that I've seen a big difference of having non-diverse teams, and this is this is all diversity I'm talking about, um, and having females in your team, having everything, every different type of person in your team makes it a stronger team. And if you're, as a leader, you fully believe that, then I believe you can build a better diverse team. I think that people can ho hopefully see through it if it's done for purely compliance reasons. Mm. Um, and when I started Sales Loft, the first time I hired, I hired seven people and I could only only hire one female. Not that the rule was that, I couldn't find them. I needed to hire quickly. Mm. So the easiest route is to hire males in sales. It doesn't mean it's the best route to take. By the time I left, we were 42% female. Wow. And it was something I was really proud of because and it was something that, if you look at Ellie Twigger and a number of other females in the industry, what they brought to the team were different perspectives, different views, different skills. And we all have different skills. Mm -hmm. And I may be told this is the wrong thing to say, but I believe skills are different on on average, skills for females are different to skills for males, I do believe. And when you mix them together and you have an environment where both male, you can both learn from each other. So that's not putting them in the box to say women like this, men like this, but they are more, te they tend to have different, I think females are better at listening, obviously. Um, and males may be better at other things, but it's mm. making that diverse team that you can all le learn from each other, but you've got to do it for the right reasons. It does make you a better team. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Well put. And talking about building those diverse teams, I think culture comes into this a lot. And you are really passionate about building a strong culture. Mm -hmm. And with that, we want to touch on coaching and development because I think that really helps add towards your culture. Um, but what would you say throughout your experience are to go back to what we initially started with, the recipe, like what are those ingredients for a really, really strong culture? It's hard to say. I, I think that it's it's got to be led by leadership. Mm -hmm. And I think that leadership make or break a culture because no matter what you've got painted on the walls or what you've got in your book saying these are our values, it doesn't count until leadership live by those values and yeah. stuff. And you've got to hire by those as well. So I think that it's it's got to come from leadership. I think that 
an open culture is what I see. I mean, I learned a lot about culture when I was at LinkedIn. I think that I that was my biggest learning. And I think that it's they've got such a good culture. I don't, can't talk about it now, but they used to have such a good culture. Talk about empathetic and compassionate leadership, building the culture, etc. So they lived by their culture and the values. They, we, it's something that we talked about regularly, not sitting around like, hippies around a campfire sort of thing <laughs> it was more a case of jeff weiner mike gamson when they're on stage talking about it but putting it into real life that they're talking about it in what we do as a business mm. and stuff and that really came through so i've learned from that that i think that your values need to be need to come through in your business mm -hmm. not and your values should actually help you make decisions your culture and values and this is what mm. mike gamson used to talk about they're not something on a wall that if it's a case of we've got a tough decision to make, does what does our culture and our values tell us should be the right answer to that decision is the good way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of sales teams, if they don't have the culture and the values and the way of uh, measuring performance, it purely comes down to how they've done against target. You can have someone that is not a nice person smashing 200% of target wanting a promotion. Mm. If the culture and values are right, then it should be a case of, well, no, gosh, you're not actually living by our culture and values. So they're very important. I think that that builds your culture. The culture comes down to how you treat your people, but also how you keep, how you develop them as well. And a, a, a culture of learning and development is very key. There is a book I've read a couple of years ago, and it talked about how you, to get people to stay and to build the right culture. It's not just about it's not about giving ping pong tails. It's about looking after them, but also they've got to see a development path and feel that they're moving somewhere in their career. Mm -hmm. And I think that creating that environment is very important because you can keep people happy, but they'll get a little bit bored if they're not being developed and pushed. Yeah, and you can have an amazing culture that you really enjoy it, but like people don't want to stay stagnant. Well, you want the people that have got drive. Yeah. So then you take people and then you're sort of not letting them perform and get further. Yeah, so you've exactly. got to help them get there. Whenever I, I always see sort of the hiring process into being an employee as a joint agreement. Mm. So I can't develop someone on my own. I need them to be committed to it as well. But it's my choice to hire somebody and their choice to join me. Mm. So it's our decision that we've got to make that person successful and it's it's not a case of right i've hired you now get on with your job yeah it's my job to make sure i'm giving them the tools and the development for them to be as successful as they can if not i'm not doing my job mm. back to your point of committed versus compliant exactly yeah. exactly it do, all it, links. do it for the right reasons <laughs> um i really want to talk about progression but to your point of values because i think that is a really important thing that maybe companies especially when the world of work is changing at the moment things can change do you think that values can change in a business or do you see them as like the the rules that you've got to live by because as you do evolve as a company I feel like that could culture and values will change as a business yes yeah. yes and they may be tweaked they may mm -hmm. change but it's they will tend to change as a business grows I would like to think that the external environment doesn't impact your culture and values it should that your culture and values should be what keeps you strong when the external environment does impact you, yeah. I would like to think. I I mean, your culture values is very much about internal, about how you deal with stuff and how you act and stuff. So I think that the external shouldn't impact it. I think the growth and stage of a company mm -hmm. will impact what their culture and their values. And mm -hmm. you do see them develop. You do see them change slightly. And especially their mission and their vision. Mm. Their mission could change when they get to a certain level or it could change because they're now looking at something different. So progression and helping develop your people is really, really important, mm -hmm. as you've mentioned. Um, you touched on at the beginning being transparent of where they can go in their career. Mm -hmm. How do you build that trust with your employees for them to feel like they can openly ask for promotions, for pay rises? It's a touchy subject that I think a lot of people struggle with, mm -hmm. especially from the female side. I think women do find that a lot more difficult to talk about. Mm -hmm. And that might be a stereotype, but it's something that we've seen throughout our communities. Um <laughs> There's quite a few answers to that. I think that if somebody has to ask for a pay rise, then there's something wrong with your, your culture. Because mm -hmm. I think that everybody should be aware of how your pay rises work and where they are in their development stage to yeah. get to the next level. So I do think that is, is something that should be looked at. I do think that leadership being open, if a, if a sales 
if anybody came to me and said, I would like to talk to you about a pay rise, that I would have an open door to that and a sec and I would say, okay, why do you feel that? And mm. let's work on it. I think it, it, it comes back to partnership again. And it's about, and when we look at development, there's a few, and there are a few answers to this. First of all, LinkedIn did a really good job of talking about transformation because most people see that my next tra- bit of transformation is my job title change and a pay rise. That to me and to, to LinkedIn, what they talk about isn't the right thing. The biggest transformation happens when you're in your current job. Mm-hmm. And if you actually talk about that in your business to explain that you're transforming in your job and then your end goal is this and then you start a new sort of journey, mm-hmm. it puts a different slant on it because they're not always looking for the A2 level, A3 level, senior AE. They're looking for the development that the, you're giving them throughout. And that right. should happen at least monthly sitting down talking about your development plan and and doing the coaching sessions Mm -hmm. so there's that side of it but i think having an open environment where you can say you're a level two these are the skills that we need for you to get to a level three Mm -hmm. and with a level three there will be a pay rise and then you're concentrating on their development areas i think the problem arises where companies don't concentrate on the development and they're Mm. sat there waiting going what do i have to do how do I how do I develop? How do I get better? That's mm. where I believe the problem arises. Well, Ollie, thank you so much for coming in today. I've learned right. so much and I'm sure all of our listeners have as well. Um, it's safe to say you've built some really successful teams over your time. And I know that Abacom is going to be exactly the same. Let's hope so. Um, but to end on this episode, something that we ask every single guest on Sales Unfiltered to show the ups and downs of sales and that not every day is perfect. What is one challenge or failure that you've faced in your career that's really shaped you to where you are today? I'd say the biggest thing that's shaped me to where I am is short of career, but not career, if I can answer yeah, it in yeah, that yeah, way. It's um, my wife having cancer. It, it shaped me and the way that I think about work, the way that I lead my team. Mm. I think before that, I was more work orientated and money hungry and all of these kind of things. And I was probably doing a lot of things over doing too much work for the wrong reasons. And I think that um, my wife and cancer actually made me, Dan Dacken was my boss at the time and I was working at LinkedIn and he said, your wife's your priority. Um, after that, your kids are your next priority. After that, you've got to have some time for yourself and do what you need. Mm. And then if you get any time to do some work, do it. And it, it really stuck with me. And I think that it changed my mindset that I'm not LinkedIn. I'm just, I'm a person that has my own life. Yeah. LinkedIn's purely the vessel that is helping me create opportunity for myself. And it completely changed the way that I lead people, the way that I think about work. I'm regularly telling people, your job is not you. You're just doing that at this moment in time. Use it as a development path to get to where you need. Go for your next job, whether it's in my company or not, I don't mind. Mm. And just seeing that different view of life, a uh, different view of work and work-life balance and stuff uh, impacted me massively the way that I think, the way that I lead and my everything I do in my day-to-day job. Thank you so much for sharing That's that. Right. And your wife is now better. She's good. She? She's seven and a bit years clear, so she's she's good. She's oh, doing incredible. well. Incredible. I think yeah, moments like that really just put your life into perspective. They do. And you're they like, do. wow. <laughs> yep. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Ollie. Thank you. And sorry to end on on that somber note, but it's also a good note. It's, it's a very a, it's a inspirational note. It's, it's a learning. It's not 100%. a somber note. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much, and thank you. yeah, see you soon. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. Check out the channel for more episodes like this one and we'll see you next week.